Good evening, and uh, thank you for such a good turnout on such a miserable night. I've been in South Africa for the last two weeks, where we lie next to the pool at this time of the year, so it's a little bit chillier. Um, thank you very much, uh, Michael. Uh, in truth, uh, I won't really be talking about advertising per se. I hope you don't mind. Yesterday, we talked a lot about work. Um, the topic of the book is a little different, and the book is about the environments, the patterns, uh, the people that seem to make things happen so you can have that idea. So this is kind of the process before, during the idea as opposed to the end result of the idea. And um, the two main reasons uh, why I wanted to write the book. Uh, all my working life, I've really been in the business of trying to have an idea myself or trying to get other people to have an idea. And uh, when I was a little bit younger, I thought, you know, you work late, you drink lots of coffee, um, you fool around a little bit, and bam, you know, ideas happen. And sometimes they do, because inspiration comes from everywhere. But as I've been growing a little bit older uh, and uh, traveling a lot around the world, you get this thing called aeroplane time. So you climb on the plane, there's their smiles, you know, chicken or beef, chicken or beef. Uh, you have your glass of wine. Uh, you go down the movies and, my God, you know, die hard 47. You know, you can't do that anymore. So you start making notes. And what I started doing was just making very general notes of, now why did that meeting go so well? Da 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 da. Or, my God, that was horrible. Why? And it was quite interesting, very quickly a pattern emerged on why things went well or why they collapsed horribly. And it didn't matter which country you went to. So we could be having a meeting in Japan or Berlin or South Africa or LA. And the same kind of patterns seem to emerge. So I thought this was quite interesting and slowly started talking about it. I was in a, I didn't really have the idea of writing a book. I had a little meeting with a, a group like this about two years ago. And I got a meeting, I, I got an email the next day that said, you should do a book about this stuff. So I didn't even have the idea myself. So mea culpa, it's not even my idea. I stole it from someone else to write the book. But I wanted to discuss, debate, uh, celebrate these patterns on the one hand. And the other reason I wanted to do the book was there is this huge bullshit theory that you have to be a special kind of person to have an idea. You know, um, and if you take this corporately, it gets even more ridiculous. You know, senior people shall have senior ideas. You know, junior people, you have the junior ideas. And so often, the exact opposite is true. Um, the silliness that, you know, in our advertising industry, if you work in the creative department, you have the ideas. You know, that guy in account management or strategy, you know, whoa, 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 slow down. You know, who says you can have an idea? So there's this absurd thing that many people believe that having an idea is you know, a gift from God. Uh, maybe you have a crystal on your head um, or something and it happens. Uh, that's not true at all. Anyone can have an idea. There is no hierarchy to having an idea. So those were the two strains, if you like, of the idea that I wanted to articulate these patterns and I wanted to explain very clearly that anyone can have an idea. Now, if you come from a place uh, like South Africa, like I do, often the difference between having food on the table is whether you have an idea or not. And I was talking yesterday with the guys in the, um, uh, the master class and Elvis, who is a, a fellow 
uh, African, talked about how great the guys are in Nigeria because they think on their feet. And that's the kind of idea that I love. He was um, telling the story how he was stopped uh, in his car, guys had wind down the window, and there was a kid who was clearly a little bit on drugs, and he wanted money. And Alva said to him, well, I'm not giving you any money because you know, you're just going to spend it on drugs. And he immediately pulled out a couple of bucks and said, no, no, I've got the drug money. I want the money for food now. You know, it's it's, it's you know, thinking on your feet. Anyone can have an idea. You know? So um, if I can make this work, I thought what might make sense is to just walk you through some of the chapters very gently and discuss them and uh, maybe you go, oh, this is just common sense revisited because these are observations. You know, I'm not claiming, oh, you know, I had an idea. It's just what I have seen. You can decide if you know, it's, it's nonsense or not, but over the last five or six years, I have seen this happen again and again. The illustrations, the paintings, are done by a friend of mine called Sam Inklingetwa, who's a very famous South African artist. And I wanted the book to have a slightly African feel because, you know, when I spoke to the publishers in New York, they said, is it a business book or is it an art book? And I said, it's both. And there was a sort of silence because, you know, Americans love categories. <laughs> and the silence along, they said, I don't know if we can do both. So I said, well, okay why don't we call it the art business book? And there was a long pause, and I said, can we change it to the business art book? Said, you got it. So <laughs> this is a business art book, and the wonderful work is by uh, Sam Intlingertwa. So, right. So what I've done is, just to give you guys a break, is animated his work for a while, and let's start with the first observation. So in the business of trying to get an idea, now this might seem to you as a homily more than a deep thought, I promised you the meeting room divides immediately. Those who suck up all the energy and those who give it out. You're a sunrise person or you're a sunset person. A sunset person has in their heart the deep knowledge that the best has happened. You're on a sliding slope to nowhere. The sunrise person has a sneaky suspicion that tomorrow might be better. And when you're in the ideas business, boy, do you love the sunrise people. Now, sunrise people have got nothing to do with age or do you dress in you know, fancy, bright clothing. Um, and particularly, being loud is often the opposite of a sunrise person. Uh, loudness means you stir a lot of nothing around and uh, quite a few people in the idea moment mistake volume for an idea and in fact the less of an idea they have the louder they talk. I don't know if you've noticed that. The most sunrise person I've ever come across was already in his 80s, walked with stiff legs and had gray hair. Um, in 1992, we were honored to do the ANC, uh, first ANC campaign uh, with Nelson Mandela. And he was the perfect example of how to radiate energy. But he wasn't full of rhetoric. You know, he was not actually a great speech maker. He's a lawyer by training. So he's measured and he thinks about it. But his integrity of purpose just sent this incredible whoosh of energy around the room. So when you were trying to come up with ideas for the campaign, which if you can imagine at that stage was very um, 
You know, these were tense times in South Africa. He had the ability to say, I have an idea for South Africa. You people out there will help me make it float. And it was incredible again and again how just by his personality, he could, you know, just when the meeting, the brainstorm, was getting into a rut and we were beginning to fight with each other and we couldn't move, you know, he'd pause, he'd talk to you as a person, never down, never, I'm the big cheese, listen to me, and he would just ask again, we're trying to achieve this. This is what this group thinks, this is what this group thinks. Surely between the two of you, we will find the middle ground. So he was kind of sunriser as mediator. But he knew what he wanted, and he knew he couldn't do it by himself. The other amazing thing was he knew if it wasn't perfect, that was okay. We could sort out the, you know, the wrinkles as you go along. The sunset person delights in finding the only wrinkle in that. You go, oh, yeah, it's great, but. So sunset people, often they just suck the oxygen away from the idea. Um, the phrases to watch out for is, you're halfway through the idea and they're going, which exco would this report to? I don't know, it's, is that relevant? We haven't agreed on the idea. Or has the finance committee seen it yet? Or, um, you know, uh, if, it's, if you think it's so unique, why hasn't someone else done it? They're just kind of negative. So whenever I'm in a meeting and I have these kind of sunset people going for you, I always think of Mandela and his calmness and an ability to um, make you feel special. He would come and he would just funny enough tell you straight to you will come up with the idea. Okay. And if he's like, Yes, sir, I, I will. And then you'd leave the room. And you were so amazed about his belief in you that you did find the idea. So so much of ideas is belief. Long before you can prove it, you believe it. He was the past master of making you believe it even before you came up with it. So Watch out for uh, sunsetters in the room. Always go for those sunrises. Fairly contentious, I'm sure. But in the idea business, logic is kryptonite. It's the stuff that kills Superman, and it's the stuff that kills ideas. Uh, logic, for me, has a heavy weight, a great mass. And the problem is not that logic is wrong. It's that in the idea business, it's often applied too early. So it bullies the idea out of existence. You're just beginning to feel something, and then the Mr. Logic guy writes, yeah, well, I've seen this before, whatever, and kills it. And the question you have to ask yourself is, whose logic applied in what circumstances? Because that keeps moving. You know, 200 years ago, uh, there was some poor guy who stuck chicken feathers to his arms, and he flapped madly at the top of the mountain, and he jumped, and he rolled down and probably killed himself. Now, the prevailing logic would be nothing heavier than air can ever fly. But because it happened then, it doesn't give it bragging rights forever. And that's what you often find with logic. It gets positioned in a circumstance or in a place that's no longer relevant. But because that's how it has been, logic bullies an idea out of existence. So I always say, yep. Logic has its place, but fight it at its own game. Say it's illogical to have it at the beginning of the idea. Bring it at the end. It's a nice ballast. It's a nice filtering process, but it's an absolutely horrid catalyst. So we all know in the end it has to make sense. But sometimes at the beginning of an idea, I cannot tell you how many ideas you start off going, I don't know where this is going, it doesn't make any sense yet. Just give a little time and apply the logic at the end rather than at the beginning 
and uh, a lot of ideas might just fly that were rather tethered. I Google, therefore I am not. Um, the bugle call of technology doesn't always bring the cavalry. Uh, sometimes in our getting, we've just got too much. So what has happened, certainly in my opinion, is we've begun to confuse information with insight. So you get these charlatans, I call them snake oil salesmen, who now arrive with the latest laptop and they make the pie charts pirouette and the bar graphs do interesting things and your company logo can spin and do all sorts of things. But at the end, all they've done is repackaged information. And information, no matter how beautifully it's been repackaged, isn't an idea. And because we have so much access to information, we tend to do that instead of be original. We just repackage it. It's a bit like saying, because you've numbered the pages of a book, you know, you've written it. You know, nonsense. So it's not that technology itself, of course, is wrong. You know, the, the web is the greatest invention of, of this decade, I guess, or the century. But be careful how you use it. Um, particularly in our industry, we find that we're deferring to technology rather than stepping aside and saying, let's have an original thought, now how can technology help? And you see this again and again and again. We forget that sometimes information can clog the system as much as it can illuminate it. And often the guy with the most things on his desktop is the one with the thinnest ideas. Because you're aggregating stuff, but you're confusing stuff with ideas. And it's probably one of the most rife things wherever I go, you know, um, globally. They're very quick, people are very quick to show you the latest thing, which is great, of course. You want to be accessible to new and fresh. But sometimes we think because we got that piece of news or that idea or this piece of design first from somewhere else, we somehow have some right to celebrate that. You know, that's not how it works. It's not first to aggregate the information wins. It's first to have an original idea and often this is getting more in the way of having an idea than illuminating one. So it's a kind of, it's a watch out. to uh, do something new, have a new thought, have a new idea. And the first thing that happens is the person in charge gets a bunch of mini into the meeting. And the mini are for two reasons. The one, so that they all think like him or her, and B, so that they know he or she is the boss. It's kind of very clear. You will have an idea that I will like, and we all think the same, and let's go for it. And it's amazing to watch because the first 10 minutes is quite exciting. You know, everyone is very keen and they're tapping their chins and coffee is being served. And you wait and nothing happens because a lot of talk is happening. But sameness is rubbing against sameness and what are you getting? The same. And you see this, I call it intellectual footsie footsie, you know, but it's incest. Because you've got sameness playing footsie footsie with sameness, and whatever they are going to produce is not going to be pretty. And then they all get this kind of discomfort. Um, it's absurd how this happens all over the world. Yesterday I was in a meeting here, well, I don't know, what, 15 people from 
12 different countries, there's a different heat in the room. People ask different questions. Sometimes it's uncomfortable. Great. But to have an intellectual country club doesn't help ideas at all. It's amazing. Um, we do these SWATs within TBWA where normally about 10 or 12 creatives come from all over the world. And you can look into the room and the different colors, the different accents, the different points of view, the room is already has a little electricity. Do that with the same people from the same agency. It's just flat. So this cross-pollination of cultures, of ideas, of departments, of age groups, that's where the richness comes from. It's just waiting. But by default, we often go back to sameness and sameness. Um, it's incredible how something as obvious as um, diversity is, is sort of politically paid lip service. I call it diversity light. Wouldn't it be appropriate that we, we better have someone from accounts in this meeting because we don't want to feel them left out? Or, you know, let's have someone from this country. That's not what I'm talking about. If you sit down with an open mind, the first thing you realize is that you're wearing blinkers. It, not because you're conservative or you're narrow-minded, but when you talk to someone else, they'll have a different view of the same idea. And suddenly you realize it's only them that can take it off. It's not that you're wrong, it's just you are some of all the received learning you have, but you don't have all the answers. And the moment someone else comes from a different angle, it's liberating. So it's not a lack of teamness. Some people defend it by saying, no, no, you know, we're a team. Well, are you a team or are you just a country club of you know, like-minded thinkers? Embrace diversity. You'll be very, very happy about what happens next. Think about the thought police. Um, they are the high priests of conventional wisdom. Uh, they're not often malicious or bad, and experience is a terrific thing to have. So you know, let's be very um, uh, upfront about that. Experience is terrific. But where the thought police get it wrong is when they turn conventional wisdom into a kind of cult, and they carry the holy tablets of the knowledge and they base it on the success of the past. And it's very, very difficult to get into these kind of people's heads and create something new because they build a kind of a fortress to the past. So they've got logic in the, uh, the moat, in the river around the fort, and this heavy experience peers out of all the windows. And in one way it's understandable because new ideas aren't always good ideas and you need people to push back and question and, but if it gets too tough and there is no movement, you hit this kind of brick wall where the thought police don't realize an idea can start out as being original, but maybe not stay that way. And the only way you can demonstrate that is you know, to throw an idea over these walls um, and try and show that if you stand still, the background behind you keeps moving. So it's terrific uh, if you're the world's best blacksmith. But if the car's just been invented, you know, be careful. That might not be the only place that you want to play. Um, the difference between conventional wisdom and experience that you want to draw from is a fine line. And it moves like this the whole time. But if you can watch out for the thought police, take the experience, mold it into some future pattern. Hallelujah, brother. Otherwise, you're in for uh, quite a tough time.
idea of apartheid is, is that everything has at the intersection of everything else. Um, it's incredible just in you know, my relatively short life in advertising how we've moved from being in silos, living in our little box, and now everything blurs and everything moves. Uh, so yes, you can be a specialist, but in the idea industry now, you better have very good peripheral vision. You better know exactly what's going on outside there as well as in there. Um, we were talking about it the other day. If your category, if, you're, if you specialize in sport, great, but you better know what's going on in media because really sport these days is a media game. It's, it's barely played for the people who sit in the, in the stadiums. It's really all about TV and web, etc., etc. You better also know about entertainment because maybe people aren't going to watch your sport because some new entertainment has come along or is on the same channel at the same time. So all we're trying to say is in the old days, we used to be specialist idea people. You know, I was very proud because I was a copywriter and I thought I could write and I did good print ads. You know, um, no one really cares too much now. They want to know where, where's the idea going to, John, not how do you make every ad a print ad. Uh, and it's, it's not plagiarism to follow these different intersections and borrow from everyone else. Uh, in fact, that's the way the world is going. I love all these shops in Berlin where they just, you know, I don't know how you can have a bell shop that makes money, but it does. And then there's a, an absinthe shop that just sells, you know, absinthe. And then there's a Japanese comic shop. And, you know, it's fantastic. Um, but if that bookshop isn't making money, it might want to buy more books, might be one way. But if it looks around the corner and there's a very successful um, Italian uh, cafe, maybe it makes more sense to get that cappuccino machine and bring it into your bookstore and sell cappuccinos while you sell the books. Now that's not cheating. That's the way the world is. So the intersections are just endless when you play with ideas. And more and more we're finding you know, around the world the smart guys happily celebrate these intersections and they don't worry where the idea comes from. They're just very concerned about where it's going to. Uh, idea apartheid, the silos, the living in your little, worrying about your label, you know, I don't think it helps much with ideas. This was just an observation I made when I would say, no, this was a great meeting. Why did it work? And who was in the meeting? And I'd kind of think of all these people. And then I'd think, what did we do that night? Or how did they act in the presentation or before in the preparation? And almost 100% of the time, the people who seem to be very idea-centric are the people who keep their mind very fertile. They do different stuff. You know, when you talk to them about what did you do this weekend, it's not always the same, same, same. As I have uh, one guy told me he loves you know, watching the Grand Prix. But he switches the sound off and he watches it to classical music. It's pretty trippy. Um, but think of the mental gymnastics your mind does while, you know, you watch these guys smash into barriers to handles water music, you know, I don't know. Um, so there's, there's so much stimulus all around and it seems as if the idea people are the ones that love that. They find it everywhere. Um, they're the ones who that night in the restaurant, you know, when, I don't know, we're in Korea and the guy goes, you know, what's that? And he doesn't understand what the waiter says. He goes, oh, I'll have it anyway. You know, he has no idea what he's eating, but he's going to try it. 
um, people who just keep doing things they haven't done before seem to be very fertile. So when a little seed drops, they get it. Those who are locked off and have had what, what I call conformity creep, you, know, you don't realize it, you live your life and you, you know, add 5% habit and you live your life another year and you add another 5% habit and then another 5% habit and soon you're really just a habit. Getting ideas to those people or from those people, really tough because you've kind of created these grids. But these people, nuns who play saxophones, um, they just, it's so much easier to work with. They love taking a chance. They love experimenting. They just seem to have a lightness of spirit, a little childlike. And again, sure, apply the logic a little later, but celebrate the child in you. And remember how you used to, as a kid, I uh, saw a very sad thing the other day. They showed me pictures of what children who drew bicycles between the ages of, I think it was two and four. And the bicycles had seven wheels and wings and there were submarine bicycles and they could just, they were fabulous bicycles. Then they showed me pictures of children who drawn bicycles between eight and ten. And all the bicycles only had two wheels and handlebars because we had been schooled, whatever, but all the good bicycles were drawn out of them. So somehow we have to keep remembering, you know, a bicycle can have eight wheels and wings. And if you can use that as a kind of metaphor, those are the kind of people who certainly when we have meetings seem to just pop up with those great ideas. Two more to go, folks. of smiles in the room already. Yeah. Um, a lot of ideas die, not because of their quality, but because of how they're transported. And to get it through a bureaucracy is kind of tough. And I now have the very firm opinion that ownership mm -hmm. is much less important than portability. And the idea that you have to have an idea so that it can go through an organogram doesn't really work. Because you say, it's my idea, and then the next level say, oh, it's his idea, and the next level say, fuck him, it's his idea. And the last level doesn't even hear. So you have four degrees of separation, and normally you know, the, the organizational chart has killed an idea. And it's not just bureaucrats, it's whenever an idea goes from one person to another, there's often this kind of invisible border post. So what I've found is have the idea and then immediately declare it their idea. Then it becomes our idea. Uh, and if you want a perfect example of that, I'm sure you've all been aware of uh, 350.org. That's our idea. People don't gather around an instruction, but they sure as hell will help if you can create a movement. So I think more and more we will be in the business of, if not bypassing bureaucracy, ideas will live or die by the weight of their own integrity, mobility. The people will decide whether it's worth passing it along or not. The border posts that you get corporately, I know you need that in business and whatever, but if you want an idea as a change agent, more and more you're going to have it, you're going to seed it, and the folks will take it from there. And yesterday we had a whole lot of examples, whether it was uh, the work we did for the Zimbabwean, uh, tiny newspaper, um, two million people decided because what we had done was interesting that within a week they would tell the rest of the world. You know, um, it's a little piece of artwork which was 
Zimbabwean ridiculous money, can you believe it, a $10 trillion note um, that started as an idea. We seeded it only by doing posters and doing billboards. And then people took pictures with their, their cell phones. The next morning, it was in the New York Times, the Huffington Post, the whatever, every newspaper in the world almost. And it now sits as a piece of art in the British Museum, as a per in permanent display. Now, that had nothing to do with going through bureaucracy. It was a great idea that everyone wanted to pass along. So more and more, as we have ideas, we have to understand the ebb and the flow in the places that it will go to will no longer be dictated by the company organogram. And lastly, bemoan sometimes the fact that our life, you know, a boring life lives in a straight line. But secretly, we quite like the comfort it brings, so we, we cling to it. Um, and we sort of, we wait for life now, you know, can you please deliver it in nice bite-sized chunks? That doesn't happen anymore. And certainly, if you want to kill an idea, just wait for some certainty to emerge, because it's not going to happen. Uh, I always tell the joke, I sent the, um, this manuscript to Jean-Marie, who's our, our chairman, uh, very intellectual, very French, read the book, liked it very much, but he came back with, you know, Jean is lost Paris. I do not like this title. It is very flippant. Uh, what is this circle, uh, circus? It's demeaning. Uh, the next day, the financial meltdown happened and I got a call and maybe it's not such a bad title <laughs> there's no certainty and the guys who have really great ideas seem to be happy with that they sort of surf it um, you know we're very fortunate to have Apple as a client he goes to, to places where there is uncertainty because that's where there's an idea you know the iPod and iTunes was made possible because the music industry was a mess. So it's deep uncertainty, but often that's where the idea lives. So this observation is about trying to be comfortable with the fact that you have no idea what's coming next. Probably the only certainty you have is you're looking left and you're gonna get smacked right. But if you can relax in that, there's huge opportunity there. The worst thing to be is scared. You know, I'm going to get back in the game when I actually know all the rules, when these new rules have been set. They're not going to be set. So if you're waiting to put your idea in when the moment is right, you'll, you'll go to your grave still waiting for the moment to be right. And part of that uh, observation is I notice that people who have ideas actually have fun. And I think it's really sad in the corporate world that having a sense of humor is often a punishable offense. You know, let's be serious about this. Um, a lot of the people who intuitively have great ideas seem to be a little bit like the court jester. Um, they see the world from a slightly different viewpoint. They know when to you know, just chip away. Maybe they're a little sarcastic here, maybe they're a little lighthearted there. But that seems to open people's thinking. So. You are allowed to have fun. We are allowed to enjoy ourselves. And in the idea business, in fact, the people who seem to be most relaxed and enjoying themselves often seem to have the best ideas. The worst is to be scared. You know, often when you start with a, an original idea, you don't know where it's going to. It's like Don Quixote, you know? You, you're starting on this journey. But these, wind, these windmills are just in our minds, and we should be happy to, to tilt at them because it's the people who start off not knowing where they're going, but with a smile on their face that funnily enough end up, you know, changing the world. So that's a brief story of the book. Uh, even if you 
hate it and you think the book is crap and the pictures are terrible, won't you buy one anyway? <laughs> or donate for it? Because the proceeds go to, um, all the profits go to Room 13, which is a thing, uh, initiative we've started. There are 34 Room 13s around the world and 14 are in South Africa. And it's a fantastic initiative because what we do is we go to really, really um, underprivileged areas and we give them essentially an art studio. Uh, the building, everything. But what is unique is they run it. So they choose a management team, they employ the artist in residence, and it can be visual arts, a um, little bit of you know, early design, storytelling, music. But the real clever part is they're in charge of the sustainability of it. So while they learn how to be creative, you know, celebrate all their creative spirit, at the same time they learn to be an entrepreneur. Because come the end of the month they have to work out how do we pay for the paint? Where's this paper coming from? So it's had a fantastic effect on children's lives. It really changes their lives. They, the, the kids that go to, to room 13 are now doing better in maths and science. Because they, they learn stuff. So please, uh, Ulrich has told me, what do I have to say, Ulrich? The book's in the back, and if you want to make a donation, that would be great. And your suggestion is 20 euros, because the book is on Amazon at 19. Okay. <laughs> you are such a capitalist. Okay. Um, thank you very much. I don't know, if the, the, am I done? Any questions? Yeah, no, I or? think we, we are running into questions. Huh? Well, um, let's start questions. And uh, I think uh, John really um, inspired us. And there will be more applause to you. And you've deserved it. I'm sure there are questions around. Uh, the first is, um, if you work for a company, you, you talked about uh, getting an idea through um, a big organization and stuff. And uh, I've experienced this several times um, to have a good idea and have to fight it through in some way, and you get to a point where the, your clients uh, start to get impatient with you perhaps, and they no longer see the point why you want uh, this idea to, to happen anymore. So they, they are not very content anymore, perhaps, and um, how do you uh, deal with this? Uh, I wish I could give you, you know, six points to deal with clients. Um, <laughs> The only observation, I can make two very practical things, is perseverance does help. So you keep going, you keep going back, and then I know you, you, you pass this invisible line where they start going, if I see you once more, I'm going to throw you out the building. Um, what we're trying to do now is include the client in the process. So, you know, up until uh, a few years ago, the client was the enemy, and it's tough because we end up presenting to them. And it's, you know, they're, they're like the Roman emperors, you know, either yes or off with his head. What we're doing more and more now is asking the client to come in for the brief. So the client actually talks, sees the people, understands. Then even having a middle point in the process, uh, we've got some loose ideas, Mr. or Mrs. Client. Come in, let's talk about that some more. So that by the time you get to that final presentation, it's sort of, again, a bit like their idea as well. And then you say things like, you know, it was a great idea when you said. And, you know, and not just to be manipulative about the, Often clients can help and do come up with great ideas. So. It's a, it's, I think we, we've made a rod for our backs the way the advertising industry is, is structured. This thing of, we brief you, come back with the idea, yes, no. Um, but that's how it is for the moment. And the only other piece of advice I can give is generally, we've found the longer we have the relationship, the more belief and obviously clients can change. Uh, the better it gets. So the reason I think a lot of Apple works so well is we have Lee at the top and Steve Jobs, and they 
they know each other so well. So if you have a client that you have for a long time, that helps. And the other one is sometimes you just get lucky. You know? yeah. So I, you know, but it's, it's a schlep and it's a grind because I think we've structured the industry the wrong way. So I'm sorry, not much help, but that's, that's great. Uh, other questions? You have one more? You have good questions, yeah? You, you have another one. Well, the, the real killer argument for, for each new idea is, uh, well, I have seen that before somewhere. So um, <laughs> do you have examples where this happened to you and you still kept on going with this idea and turn off fine? The problem is the definition of the idea. Uh, sometimes, you know, very small times, sometimes the client is right. Hey, oops, it was somewhere else. But often, if you go to the idea apartheid is dead, so much more now we are borrowing little pieces from everyone else. I don't mean plagiarism. I don't mean go and do what someone else has done. But an idea for me is, is A, it's becoming much more of a team sport, and B, it it has many more facets to it. So the moment you have the idea, what we're finding, get the client to agree the idea first, not the execution, and then come back with a whole set of different executions. But the moment they've agreed at the top level, I like this idea, it helps you a lot for them to buy the execution. When you go in with the execution done, they go, mm -hmm. a car ad with a car. I think I've seen that before. You know, so it's, a, it's really, really difficult. The worst case I ever had just was um, we, we launched a, a chain of bakeries. And we were, in our days, very irreverent. So our baseline was, uh, give us this day our daily bread. So we thought it was very, and uh, the client sort of bought everything. And then on the way out, he said, I think I'm changing my mind. I said, why? He said, give us this day our daily basis. I think that's been done before. <laughs> so it's kind of like. OK, you see, good question. Great answer. Uh, another question? Thank, thank you very much. It's been very illuminating. But I'm a little curious. You, you began by saying everybody can have an idea. And yet many of the observations seem to be that there are sunrise, sunrise, sunrise sunset people, almost as though there's idea people and anti-idea people. And yet I suspect the truth at the bottom of it might be something like idea people need anti-idea people to create balance. Can you share thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, that's a, a very good question. I think anyone can have an idea because I think a lot of people are sometimes labeled non-idea people. And we've had experiences with, we have these disruption teams and we have these SWAT teams and we mix them sometimes. And I don't want to put finance people in the box, but we've had great ideas pop up from the finance guys who maybe wouldn't classically in that environment be seen as idea people. So I think, um, I, I truly do believe there's no DNA that says you can't have ideas. I think, though, there are people who are more uh, proposed, uh, leaning toward, are more naturally idea people. In the process, to have some real son of a bitch in the meeting keep questioning you, is not bad, of course, because you have to come back and come back and come back. It's just when they are terminally negative, they, their deal is to make sure it doesn't. And that is sometimes an extreme. And sometimes, you say, in the process, it's quite good to have this, this guy who keeps testing you and coming back. And um, I say one part in, in the book, um, expediency isn't an idea one of the chapters we didn't do. And that relates exactly to the point you're making. Often we get expedient because, hey, you know, I think I can do it, but I don't know if my 
boss would go for it. Or, you know, I'm a, so you get expedient. Often those people who are blamed for being the naysayers are actually the ones that just want to test you. And that's a very valid thing. You, you, you want to have this to and fro. It's just if you're too, if in our environment and you, you're trying to get an idea through, if the room moves where those sunsetters start overweighing, it just makes your life a lot tougher. Uh, to, to that point then, John, if, uh, when possible, what's the best way to turn a sunset into a sunrise? Yeah, you may not be on my side, now you're going to be a tough <laughs> question. Um, it does go down into to individuals. Um, and I'm, I'm very lucky to be able to, you know, you stick up Mandela and then you can, you know, it's like the most sunset. He, because of who he was, so in other words, people who have that integrity can tip people. Um, if you have a very good CEO who uh, in a meeting says, today we're going to set out to solve this problem. I'm going to lock the door almost, and we don't leave until it's solved. It's amazing what a a deadline can do for an idea. And in those kind of cases, I find the sunsetter knows there's, there's a deadline. Oops, uh, I'm going to be negative, but if I'm negative the whole day, I'm, I'm not leaving. So there are kind of like tricks like that where it's also a part in the book where these days an idea mustn't just be original, it must be on time. And thankfully, because we live in this crazy world, those sunsetters get sort of, time knocks them out. Okay, well, this is the best. You don't like it. Time's up. Bam. Generally, though, it's, it's a little bit of a DNA thing. And we all know those, those kind of people. I don't want to kind of make too much of it. But it's just to be aware of them. And sometimes, you know, your boyish charm will, you know, get a sunsetter into a sunriser. But if you're aware of them, you try and get the room with more of the other people in it. The mic, who wants to have it? Oh. Um, thank you. You said something before about sharing the idea and ownership of the idea. That uh, if it's his idea, then to the next level and down and down. Like it seemed to me like it's about energizing the idea, like sharing it. Like what do you do within such a big corporation? Like within the creatives, they're very vain. They always want to be his, uh, my idea, also for their own career. Like what do you do in your company that really within the whole levels that it's a shared idea, that it's not his or your idea? Like do you have any structures to guarantee this? Um, not exactly, but the fact that we don't have much hierarchy immediately helps. You know, there's a, a strange anomaly there. There's, there's the <coughs> ego guy, vain. He wants to keep the idea, but it's by sharing it that even, even if he had the eureka moment, aha, I have an idea, it's the ripple that makes it big or not. Holding on to it is just plain stupid. So in time, I think more and more, call it of the whatever, new generation creatives, will see that because that's how the world works. The, the, I don't know, he looked about 14, the guy who did um, 350.org. Um, the kids understand this now. You know, that's the way the world is. And that strangeness of having a big ego and saying, you know, it's mine, it's mine, and protecting it, I think in time will disappear. We do have a saying, it sounds a bit glib, but it, it works. The bigger the ego, the less the echo. So it's quite a nice way, because these days you want, to, you want your work to echo. You want it to go all the way out. So the guys with the biggest egos end up, you know, they're very important to themselves. Um, and that's just kind of dumb. So in terms of structure, the flatter and the more integrated kind of seems to look after itself. Because often, um, and the guys in, from TBWA here who've been in, in a squat uh, with me, we don't know who came up with the idea at the end of the day. Someone said something, someone blah, 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 blah. And who cares? 
So it's often the way, if more people work on it, that seems to be a self-filtering thing. Who cares? Yeah, you've got a good idea. More questions? Uh, I have one. Um, in a way, uh, I found out that ideas have two kind of values. On one side, they're pain in the ass, uh, and people don't want it because yeah. ideas make more work, they create confusion, um, they are not practical most of the times, they cost money, they yeah. cost time and so forth. Yeah. And on the other hand, you know, it is just yeah. the most beautiful thing on earth. Mm -hmm. And there is in many organizations yeah. probably a huge fight, should I go the extra mile, should yeah. I convince yeah the logic that we all also have to make money, and usually in the first yeah. place, ideas don't produce a lot of money, maybe. Yeah? So should I make the shortcut? Yeah. Should I give in? Or should I fight, yeah. fight the attitude yeah. to go through the, the pain, yeah. basically? Yeah? Yeah. So ideas don't come easy. Yeah. And, and you know, you have the, the experience yeah. with your organization, mm. uh, kicking out, I mean, yeah. ideas that set, set new standards. So you yeah. must overcome this yeah. pain a lot. Yeah. And there is more to fight than just the attitude you're presenting here. It's more sure. a brutal fight you also yeah. have to take. Um, it can be very brutal. Uh, it's strange, though, and because that's also changing. S um, some of our biggest clients are becoming the most nimble, which again sounds wrong again, because of all the change, they, they are seeing that if they behave the way they did in the past, it's, it's no pattern for the future. So this is always just, oh, that's very academic and I've heard that before. But then it's starting to hit their bottom line. And that's the only thing that makes business way. Oh, shit, sales are down. So we can be the the cool idea people till we blew in the face. Yeah, yeah, very nice, thank you, you know, move on. But the clients are discovering by staying the same, by not experimenting, by not being different, anymore, they're being punished. They're being punished by the market. Um, so a lot of the clients, funny enough, are now coming to us saying, can we move this along? Then the next fight happens because they ask for change then you deliver it and they go, oh, not that much change, um, yeah, steady. Uh, so then you get that kind of, you know, it's like, um, it's like a mating dance, you know, uh, one step forward and two steps back and the client would like you to, maybe, you know, yeah, later, uh, you know. Uh, but generally, they really do understand. You just have to look at the way the media has changed. You can't do what you used to do. So that's becoming a, it's still a fight, but the, the CEOs, the marketing directors are seeing whatever, market share, drop. Uh, no one's buying my car. Uh, people aren't watching TV anymore. What are we going to do? Uh, and sometimes you, us as agencies are playing catch up. And because there's not a pattern for the future, we have to pretend we know what we're doing a lot more than we actually do. Well, adding here the, the, the in, uh, question that probably is the most important for us uh, in the school. Um, you know, change and this wisdom and insight is very hard to succeed when it comes from the bottom. Yeah. It has to be led by the people who run a place. Can you say something about that? Yeah. You know, what we found is if the debate about change, if we can, the, the, the more senior it, it is, and I, I don't mean to, to belittle middle management, but you find generally the younger band up for change, and if you can get to them, the CEO kind of, it's the middle guys that put the handbrake on because they're not sure, you know, they second guess what, the boss might think. 
So we often try just to find ways of being respectful to middle management, but getting the, the organizing principle, the idea, as high as we can, not the executional stuff. Uh, more and more of the CEOs today are showing more interest in what in the old days would be called marketing. And I think that's going to increase. But what we've also done now with a lot of our clients is, okay, we understand you, know, you locked in the way you behave. Um, it's difficult to change. There's no roadmap. Give us 5 or 10% of your budget and call that experimental budget. And we will prove to you or we'll try and prove to you or we'll take an experiment with you to see how we can make that portion give you a much bigger quantum, a, re, a good return on investment. And you can see if we're bullshitting or not, or you know, it's a, it's a calculated risk rather than betting the whole farm on, on something new. So the whole way we go about doing business with these clients is changing. And they, they are slow, but they are definitely more open to these kind of the new dance. If there are no more questions, the book signing will start and the donation uh, will start. But uh, maybe as a summary, uh, maybe the crisis that we are going through is probably the most vital thing for us to now go for ideas. Uh, when the markets are going well, probably people are risk adverse. Now, entrepreneurs are they love the risk and they go for it. So I think out of this crisis, really fresh stuff should come. Yeah. We're very happy to have Phil Thomas here, uh, the CEO of the Cannes Festival. And uh, probably the crisis will produce more amazing stuff than we're thinking right now. Certainly, I think last year, particularly John's yeah. work was a good example of that. Some of the work is more exciting than, uh, yeah, yeah. than it's been for a long time, I think. Yeah. Crisis is not a bad thing. I mean, it's no, a terrible no. thing because of, <laughs> of yeah, the it, human yeah. side. I yeah. understand that. But um, even in our own very simple TVWA way, we sorry about Cannes because we invite 350 people to Cannes a year normally. This year we had five. But we had a film crew with us, and through our intranet, we got Cannes to 11,000 people. So for the whole of TVWA, it was their best can they ever had, because for 25 minutes a day, they got footage. But would we have done that if there wasn't a crisis? Of course not. We would have been boring, habitual, so we all have to stay true to it. You have the power of an idea. Not everyone will like it. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thanks, John. Well, that's great to have you here. Okay. And let's now film the books. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, yeah.